Islamic world. And so he gives the Cairo speech where he says, back well, in the summer after he was elected, Mr. Cairo gives a speech, you know, the usual suspects, Islam is a, Islamic civilization is wonderful, too bad you just have a few bad apples, but you know, it's our fault anyway. I mean, basically, that's what he said in the Cairo speech. Um, the Nobel Prize acceptance speech, same sort of thing. The follow-up to Benghazi, you remember, the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. That was back when they were still doing the narrative of, you know, the, the, the killing of our ambassador and three other people was because of the, 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 the yeah, anti-Muhammad yeah. video. Yeah, videos. Yeah. Right. The, the Attorney General testifies before Congress. You've probably seen the video from a year or two ago. House Judiciary Committee, his representative, I think Lamar Smith from Texas, kept asking him about Hassan and Shahzad and does this radical Islam have anything to do with this? And Holder wouldn't say it. Finally, if you watch that tape, two, three minutes, finally at the end of that clip, Holder says, but you know, I'm not going to, something like I'm not going to mischaracterize an entire religion. I mean, thinking, so I looked up, Holder's an Episcopalian. I, I don't know when Episcopalians became experts on Islamic theology, but I guess when they become Attorney General. <laughs> the most problematic one, of course, is the Director of Central Intelligence that we just, uh, you know, just, just uh, verified for office, Brennan. There's all kinds of stuff you see. I have some friends who are convinced that Brennan himself actually is converted to Islam because he was, he was CIA station chief in, in, in Riyadh for a while. I, I don't buy that. But he's clearly Islamo, not phobic, but Islamophiliac. He bleeds Islam. I mean, that's probably not inaccurate. I mean, this is what he said. This is a direct quote from him in an interview. Describing our enemy in religious terms is wrong and counterproductive. Nor do we describe our enemy as jihadists or Islamists. Although, note, that's how they describe themselves. <laughs> because jihad is a holy struggle, a legitimate tenet of Islam. Well, of course it's a legitimate tenet of Islam. Muhammad engaged in it, but it's violent and nonviolent. Meaning to purify oneself or one's community, and there's nothing holy or legitimate or Islamic about murdering innocent men, women, and children. Now, I've had a discussion with a number of people about this who are convinced that Brennan knows this war, but Brennan is trying to, the argument goes, uh, you know, sort of convince the Islamic world that their own history and theology is really not very helpful and they should probably kind of move toward this definition, okay? I don't know, the, the, the hubris of that is rather breathtaking, isn't it? Yeah. It, 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 and beyond that, I don't really think it's working. <laughs> because I don't see any diminution in jihad and holy war. Uh, particularly under a president who, you know, ironically is engaging in more drone strikes in a month than the Bush administration did in four years. I mean, we're just flying around the world whacking people whenever we feel like it. And, you know, not that I have a great deal of um, uh, tears I'm going to shed for guys in Waziristan who have been killing people and planting IEDs. But, you know, practically one might think about the fact that we're not getting very useful intelligence when we just blow people up. <laughs> But I mean, the director of central intelligence basically says, I know more about Islam than Muslim scholars over the span of 1,400 years. So one either has to think that Director Brandon is willfully ignorant on a scale that is breathtaking, or he is doing this for some reason, Machiavellian you know, political reason, but it's not working. And to be fair, the Bush administration was not exactly, you know, stellar on this either. I mean, how many times did President Bush give the speech about Islam's religion of peace and a few bad apples and, you know, the Tony Blair, I think Tony Blair is the first one to use the phrase, hijacked. Like, well, Islam was only hijacked by extremists if you think Muhammad himself was an extremist. <laughs> so, practical effects of this, okay? And again, I, I bring up this first issue not because um, I'm trying to say what happens to me is that important, but because it's indicative of what's going on. You know, I, I used to be a special, regular guest lecturer at Joint Special Operations University in, 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 uh, in Tampa. Used to be at Herbert Field, if any of you know. They moved it to Tampa. Yeah, moved it. Um, which is much better, because flying to Fort Walton Beach is just frightening sometimes. The pilot usually had on, like, goggles and a scarf, so I used to be... <laughs> <laughs> um, I had to go out front, you know, push the propeller on the plane, so... That's um, and the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, if anyone's familiar with this, it's down in Glencoe, down below Savannah. 
Does anyone know about this place? Yeah, it's the main training facility, at least it was, I think it still is, for Department of Homeland Security. And I was a regular guest lecturer there for several years on history of terrorism, primarily. And I was told at both places, one two years ago, the other one last year, that I, no, I take that back, three years ago for Fletzy, two years ago for JSAL, that my uh, services would no longer be needed. And after I pressed a little bit, somebody finally told me why. Well, um, you talk about Islamic terrorism too much in a class on the history of terrorism. <laughs> I had a 49, 49 screen PowerPoint presentation. And trust me, I, I, was, I used to teach world history, among other things. I was quite inclusive and diverse. If I say those two words again, you gave your permission to throw something at me. I was quite open-minded about bringing in terrorism, going back to the ancient world, I mean, the, 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 the Assyrians, the Romans, I mean, you know, crucifixion was a sort of state-sponsored terrorism. I talked about, you know, China, I talked about all kinds of civilization, but it's really hard to talk about history of terrorism and ignore Islamic terrorism, especially when they were handing me a check at the end of the day. I figured I should probably do a good job. But I was told there, and then flat out, and Chase Alley told me that, at uh, the HS facility, they just said, the edict that come down from on high do not employ anyone who mentions the word jihad. Wow. So. It's a four-letter word. Yeah, so, yes. Why is that? Why are they fighting the realities of Can we hold our questions to I'll get to that, I promise. So that's one thing, all right? And then other people, some of you may know who Steve Coughlin is. I don't know if you know. Steve Coughlin's a former Army um, officer who wrote a, a master's thesis on, uh, on jihad and Islamic warfare. He used to be on Dick Cheney's, <laughs> brought Dick Cheney four times. It's more press than he's gotten in a long time. Um, used to work on Dick Cheney's staff at the DOD. And, um, and Stephen was basically canned because some Islamic advisor there took offense to talking about, you know, operationally talking about jihad and Islamic warfare. So, you know, we have that going on. Uh, basically, you may have seen some of the news reports recently. There's a concern that um, because groups like CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, has been allowed to vet uh, not just, not just uh, training materials, but hires and policy in this administration, that, you know, when, the, when Tamerlane and Zardaya went off to Chechnya and hung out for Dagestan, it was Dagestan, I believe, wasn't it? Which is close. Um, Same me, you. Went over there and hung out in a mosque for a while with some of these guys that have been fighting the Russians for years, for six months, and then came back, the Homeland Security Department just let it go. I mean, it's, it's frankly, I can tell you from working to some extent on the inside of some of this, far from being Muslim, being a re heretofore, perhaps this thing in Boston has changed it, I hope it has, but far from being Muslim, being a, you know, a, a, you know, a red letter uh, sign of, of somebody we need to watch out for, it's the opposite. It's been like a protect, a deflector screen. I mean, if you looked at the PowerPoint presentations that, that Hassan was giving as an army psychiatrist, you know, things about how infidels will suffer the tortures of hell unless they convert to Islam. First of all, what's that got to do with an army psychiatry lecture? And secondly, I mean, if somebody came in to, if you were an army doctor and you were a Pentecostal or a Baptist or a Lutheran, of course Lutherans would never do this, but if you were a Pentecostal or a Baptist and went and gave a lecture in a professional venue about, you know, non-Christians going to hell, you would rapidly get ridden out of there. Yeah. But they just let it go because his chain of command was afraid, morbidly afraid of being accused of Islamophobia. It's become basically, it's gotten that bad. Sharia, as many of you probably know, Sharia is creeping into the U.S. legal system. Now, when I say that, I had an argument about I spent some time as sort of an unofficial advisor to the Herman Cain folks. And they paid no attention to me, so I figured it was wasting my time, although they had asked me for some position papers on things. And No. Chuck look. Ah, why is it searching for signals? Because it got tired. Oh. I know how it feels. No sense no signal. David will fix that for us, God willing. Inshallah. But I was talking to the, the Cain people. Talking to the Kane people. Uh, I lost my train of thought. How did I get to Herman Kane? You were advising. They didn't pay attention to They didn't pay attention to Yeah, you. but what did I say right before that? The for Herman Yeah, no, but right before she that. 
Sharia it's creeping law. into Sharia law. law. Thank you. Yeah. Sharia law. It is a court system. I do this to my kids all the time, so don't feel bad. Um, <laughs> what was I chewing you out about again? Oh, nothing. Um, remember, Herman stepped in it at one point when he when he when he made a uh, comment on about you know this 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 flap about the the big mosque that's being built in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. If anybody's mm -hmm. following that. The, the Muslim community of like 60 people in Murfreesboro, Tennessee wants to build a, you know, like a 70,000 square foot mosque. Yeah. First of all, where are they getting funding for that? Secondly, why do you need a 70, uh, actually it actually wasn't 70, but I think it was like 30 or 40,000 square foot mosque. It was just a, disproportionately huge for the population of, of the Muslim community. And people were asking legitimate questions, and you know, some people just kind of make jack wagons out of themselves, you know, and say dumb things. And, and Herman at one point said something like this, you know, Communities should be allowed to say that you can't have mosques. I think that's ridiculous. Muslims are allowed to practice, or allowed to worship, because last time I checked, although I'm a Christian, this is an officially secular republic. However, on the other hand, on the other hand, I think communities should be able to ask questions, like there's 65, 60 of you, why are you building a mosque that's like the size of Notre Dame Cathedral, all right? Where are you getting the money for this? Who's giving you the money for this? I think these are legitimate questions, Sorry. right? Possibly, very likely, but again, these are questions that I think communities should be able to ask. Mm -hmm. And then also, but I'm bringing that up because there's some people that will argue, that will obfuscate and say that, well, if you're against Sharia, you're against Muslims practicing their religion. Well, not at all. Sharia means that the government imposes Islamic norms on everybody or on a certain community. No one's, what we're saying, we're against that. We're not against people building a mosque. You don't need Sharia to have a mosque. CARE has basically, again, obfuscated this issue very clearly so that if you are opposed to Sharia, if you are opposed to the imposition of any sort of Islamic norms, not even imposition, the sort of uh, infiltration, I should say, of any Islamic legal norms into the American legal system, you're against Muslims. No, you can build a mosque, do whatever you want. But you can't come into court and say, you know what, Islamic law says I'm allowed four wives, so you should let me have four wives. Yeah, no, you're not changing our norms like that. If you want four wives, go to a country where they let you have four wives. Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Iran, you know, Iran, they just passed legislation that you can marry down to 13. Well, if they really followed Islamic law, they would allow down to nine. Why? Because Muhammad's, one of Muhammad's wives was nine years old when he mm -hmm. consummated the marriage. This again, not according to me or Dick Cheney's staff, according to the Islamic sources. We should just be thankful that most Muslims don't go by that. But the ones that do are not making it up. They are following the example of Muhammad himself. <laughs> See the problematic issue here? So, and I think what we're starting to get in this country are Muslim enclaves. I don't know if you follow me, but Dearborn, Michigan. Yes. Oh my God. Dearborn, Michigan is basically turning into a place where the Constitution of the United States seems not to apply. Absolutely. Sharia norms are being enforced there by local officials. You know, the mayor, the police chief. I mean, it's just, it's just, right now. on the other hand, I think that one Christian group that got stuff thrown at them, basically, I frankly don't think we're being very Christian myself. But the point remains that, you know, if any other group went somewhere and Christians treated them like they were treated by the Muslim group, it would be, it would be front page in the New York Times for seven months. So, so um, and as I said, analysts are not allowed to discuss stuff, which makes it very problematic. Yeah, and then and this, is, this is the analogy that I always tell people. It's just like in World War II saying you can't talk, can't talk about Nazi ideology because it'll make the Germans feel bad. <laughs> Or, or you can't talk about, um, during the Cold War, you know, you can't discuss uh, Das Kapital because most Russians don't believe that. Well, okay, but that's still operative in many minds and we need, analysts need to know it. I don't know, what can you do? I mean, I've just tried to think of some stuff that, that, that you know, individual citizens can do. You know? I mean, the big thing, I think, is to get informed. And then, sorry for my typo, that should be educate friends. Although some of your educated friends no doubt need to be educated. You know, talk about this stuff, be informed. Okay, Islam is a religion, as I said. Um, there are sects of Islam that do not believe in Quranic literalism and that are not violent. I mean, one group is called the Ahmadis, and there's an Ahmadi guy that often shows up on 
uh, Fox and Friends will have it on in the morning. They, they just never identify him as an Ahmadi Muslim, however, usually. Uh, but the Ahmadis are an offshoot group that developed in the uh, early 20th century that most Muslims consider to be at best heretical. Um, but they, they officially say that jihad means, it doesn't mean holy war ever. Huh. This is a minority view, but there are some sects that believe that. Right? Islam is not the same as Judaism and Christianity, okay? It's just not. This is one of the big tropes that, that, that's being pushed by uh, Muslim, Muslims and their apologists. It, it's, it's basically the same. No, it's not. And as I, you know, just because you're wary of Islamic fundamentalism does not make you Islamophobic. So, you know, question that term. Reject that term. You know, support movements to ban Sharia from the U.S. court system. I'm sure some of you are already on that. Yeah. Elect people all of us who know the real score. Now, look, I voted for Romney, much like I did McCain and Bob Dole before him, holding my nose uh, with a blindfold and a cigarette in my mouth. Um, <laughs> Romney, Romney was not, I, I did a couple of articles on Romney, and he, he wasn't a whole lot better than the president on this issue. I mean, he was on record in several different venues of saying and writing that jihad basically is an aberration. Right, so he was, you know, almost in as much woeful denial as president is. <clears throat> and look, reach out to Muslim friends. Again, odds are that most, most Muslims in America aren't literalist Muslims. The, although, I mean, <coughs> statistics show this is true. It's still a very high percentage, but it's much less than it is in most other Muslim countries uh, overseas. So, you know, by definition, if they come here, most of them, I mean, obviously we talked about the exceptions, most Muslims, however, are not going to be this sort of, you know, literalistic, uh, potentially violent person, but some are. So, and I do have to say that over the last couple of years, when I've been dealing with some of the, uh, as I'll put it, my more extreme libertarian friends, the ones that sort of shade over into, you know, Ayn Rand is a new prophet and religion is just goofy, and everyone that believes in religion is equally irrational. And I would say, well, even if that were true, one religion, that, there's a religion that teaches you to turn the other cheek and love your neighbor as yourself, despite the fact that most people that belong to that religion don't do that. And there's another religion that tells you never take other people from other religions as friends, and you're allowed to chop their head off, heads off in certain contexts. Now, even if both of them are just made up, which one do you think is more injurious to society? <laughs> so, you know, at that point, they usually, you know, Drock, you as a Facebook friend, but that's the stupid. <laughs> now notice this, okay, this is John Quincy Adams, this was after he left the White House, right, and gone back to the House of Representatives. Um, at one point said, Muhammad declared undistinguishing and exterminating war as a part of his religion against all the rest of mankind. The precept of the Koran, actually, Koran, but the precept of the Koran is perpetual war against all who deny that Muhammad, the old spelling there, is the prophet of Islam. All right, now we have uh, President Obama. This was when he was in India in 2010, speaking to a, <coughs> excuse me, predominantly Muslim audience. More than a billion people practice this law, yes, an overwhelming majority view their obligations to religion that reaffirms peace. I think all of us recognize that this great religion, in the hands of a few extremists, has been distorted by violence. Well, you know, a few out of 1.5 billion, I would, you know, People ask me, well, how many Muslims believe like this? I'd say, I, no one knows for sure, okay? I would say certainly 10%, mm -hmm. which means 90% don't. But 10% of 1.5 billion, I'm a historian, help me, that's still a lot of people. <laughs> you know, and obviously we don't have 150 million terrorists in the world, but, and there's various levels of this. I mean, there are people that facilitate. Um, you know, people talk about the Tsarnaevs being quote unquote self-radicalized. They didn't self-radicalize. They were raised as Muslims, all right? You get these passages, you know, you go to the, you go to the, you go to, uh, you go to the uh, mosque on Friday and the Imam will read from the Quran, preach from the Quran, all right? And what happens is, at some point you decide, you really want to take this seriously, you know, you're in a strange environment, you know, and you feel disconnected and you want to sort of reconnect with what you think of your roots, and you start go looking up, you know, Anwar al-Awlaki stuff, and he tells you, you know how you're a good Muslim? You take um, Surah Muhammad, verse 3, which says, behead the unbeliever, and you go do that literally. That's how you're a good Muslim, especially if you live in infidel lands. You know? And unfortunately, I mean, this, that's not self-radicalization. You know, unfortunately, the law, there was a ground there, a literal interpretation of Islam, that 
allows those who are predisposed toward violence to rationalize it. That's the unfortunate thing. But it is true. I mean, remember a year, year and a half ago, two years ago, when there was the latest flap about Quran burning? Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it was, um, uh, you know, it was blamed on us, as it always is. Uh, but th this is the, one of the PowerPoint screens that was given out in Afghanistan to troops. And if you see the third one, U.S. service members and civilians are required to handle the Quran and the performance of the duties should do so using a clean cloth or clean gloves. Look, I have respect for Islam, I have respect for Muslims, but I'm not a Muslim. I should not be expected to abide by Muslim rubrics. That would be like telling non-Muslim, uh, or telling Muslim, or Jewish, or Buddhist, or Hindu um, people in the military that they have to like kiss the Bible when they, when they come in in the morning or something. There would, be a, there would be a rightful outcry about that. But yet, this administration is basically telling people, and this, this, this has been going on in Gitmo, to be fair, since the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. They literally put gloves on, I mean, the kind I put on when I get my dog's medicine ready for her, those little rubber gloves, and pick up a Quran. But they aren't Muslims. They're being forced to act either as Muslims or as what's called Vimis. Vimy is a second-class citizen under Islam. I mean, this is ridiculous. And, you know, it hasn't caused any reduction in terrorist attacks. Yeah. Last screen, this is interesting. This is from 1917, Pershing's <coughs> Crusaders. Official US government um, film and poster, you know, interesting. And I'm, look, I'm not calling for going back to the Crusades. I just bring it up to show you the incredible uh, changes that have taken place, where, where you know, this country, which is 76% Christian, my last analysis, you know, we pretend that the 76% that are Christian are the problem because of their intolerance and so on and so forth. And the 0.8% from where most of the terrorist uh, acts and individuals come are not the problem. So that, um, uh, that's a, quite a change in, you know, less than a century. All right. Thank you.